All right, guys. Are we on? We're on, friend. We're on like Donkey Kong. All righty then. Let me just do this. Sorry about that. How you guys doing? <clears throat> hey, friends. How are you, brother? Thank you. I pray I get handsome and healthier. Pray. If the Lord Jesus is pleased to use me for many more years and keep me around, to help me to lose more weight, get my health back for his glory, to be holier than ever before, truly be like Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit, and bless my, my daughters. Uh, I'm hardly in a good mood, Lisa, <clears throat> but let's wait. Hopefully more people show up. What's up, Los Fest? God bless you. Yeah, I decided to answer this question that came up yesterday. What's up, my brother, 1611? On our way to heaven. Hold on. Hold on. Okay, sorry about that. We got these dogs. Oh. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. I want to answer this question. I thought the Bible says God the Father cannot be seen, right? Okay, Johnson, what's up? This is an objection that even Joe's witnesses bring up and other anti-Trinitarians, including Muslims, right? <clears throat> so I want to answer it, hopefully, once and for all, and then people can come back and just watch the video. I'm going to demonstrate that the Bible does not say God the Father cannot be seen, right? does not say God the Father cannot be seen. That's actually a misunderstanding, misinterpretation of the passages. We'll talk about it, but, you know, let's wait for a few more faces to show show up. Thank God Protestant is here. God bless every one of you. My bro's there. Oh, there you so Super uh, looking good. Keep praying I look better in Jesus' name. Yeah, we got a dog. Okay, sorry about that. Here you go. This guy's gonna show up. Some some dog's gonna come show up. We're gonna have to muzzle him. These dogs, dude. Just you know. Yep. I may have to. It'll take me a couple minutes to deal with these. Yeah. I. It, I. Sorry, guys. People say, why do you keep calling people dogs? Because it's a scriptural term. Anyone who perverts scripture, distorts scripture, blasphemes the true God, <clears throat> and pontificates on the Bible, even after being corrected, <clears throat> in my book, that makes you a dog, right? And so I'm going to treat you accordingly. <clears throat> Hopefully my voice will stay up. <coughs> la, 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 la. La, 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 la. Yep. We're, we're probably going to be visited by a dog who says he's not a oneness even though he is. So we'll see. It's okay. How you doing, guys? Hopefully. We're going to answer the question. God the Father cannot be seen. Figaro. Yeah. Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. Figaro, Figaro. Figaro, 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 Figaro. Because I'm drinking coffee. That's not good. But hopefully you guys are doing well. This is impromptu. I wasn't planning on being here. Tomorrow, God willing, Lord Jesus willing, I fly out to Colorado for a week. So if I have time there, I'll try to live stream, right? I'm going to meet with some brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. I'm going to attend the conference, and at the end of the week, I'll be teaching with two brothers on Islam and Christianity. And then hopefully when I get back, pray, Lord Jesus willing, by the grace of God, I'll get back by the 5th, and by the 7th to the 9th, around that time, I'll have everything in order, right? License updated, car tuned up. And I'll be heading out, Lord Jesus willing, please, Lord Jesus, I'll be heading out to my new destination. Pray for favor that I get the green light. You know, tired. I'm really tired of where I'm at. <clears throat> I just want to leave and start a new life. And, you know, if the Lord is pleased, wants me to keep around to glorify him, amen. If not, take me in his love and mercy, you know. No better place than to be with Jesus. No more pain, no more suffering, no more...
problems, no more trials, no more struggles with the flesh, succumbing to the flesh, none of that. No more heartache seeing people suffering around you. You know, God is good. But anyway, good to see you. All the sirens are here. Matt Koshi, what's up, buddy? Okay. <clears throat> I shouldn't be drinking coffee and speaking, but, you know, that's me. You okay, man? You seem sad. Yeah, life is sad, Edward. Life is sad. Believe me. Without Jesus Christ, put it this way, and don't think I'm speaking morbidly. I'm just speaking factually. Without Jesus Christ, this world is meaningless. It's useless, and we're nothing but waste of space and breath, right? It's because of Jesus Christ that we have true meaning and purpose in life, and we continue to press forward and enduring for his glory, right? Honestly, if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, what purpose, what reason do you have to continue? If Jesus isn't real and he's not God, and all we are are molecules in motion, right? Bags of molecules, molecules, then we have no worth. We're no better than stardust, right? So what's the point of existing? Do you get my point? But because Jesus Christ is God, he is real, he created us for his glory, and he created us in his image, which gives us value because we bear his image, life is worth living for his glory, for his honor, for his praise. Right? Exactly, as Lopez said, if atheism, naturalism are true, then it's nothing but despair. And why continue to exist? You get what I'm saying? You with me there? Exactly. So let's ask the Lord to bless. Ask the Lord to help me crucify my flesh. Ask the Lord Jesus to help every one of us to crucify our flesh. Because we all have certain sinful tendencies and struggles. My struggle will be anger, impatience, carnal desire, that I beg the Holy Spirit to mortify in me, crucify in me, and give me victory. Your struggle may be different, but don't be deceived. Every one of you, there are certain sinful tendencies that you engage in and struggles that you haven't overcome yet, right? So, But my struggles won't be the same as yours, vice versa. So we ask the Lord Jesus to gr grant us grace to be patient with one another. And that he'll be patient with us and give us the power of the Holy Spirit to walk more in the life and power of the Holy Spirit so we can crucify the flesh <clears throat> more and more every day. <clears throat> so we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, you don't need me. And I want to remind myself daily so that by the power of the, uh, your Holy Spirit, you'll save us from being puffed up with ourselves, being arrogant, Proud and unteachable. Save us from that, Father. Lord Jesus, save us from that. Holy Spirit, save us from that. Save me from that. Destroy my pride and my arrogance and my nastiness, Father. So I can be more like Jesus towards the church. And to love them with the love of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, bless them, Father. Those who are here, bless them. Bless me. Bless all of us. And bless our loved ones, Father. Bless my daughters, my angels. Cover them. Cover every one of us with the blood of Jesus Christ, cleanse us in the blood of Jesus Christ and fill us with the Holy Spirit. And Father, please save me from error, from confusion, from stammering, from misinterpretation of Scripture, Father. And bless everyone with wisdom and power and knowledge from your Holy Spirit to understand the things I say if they're from the Spirit. And give us the power then to live those truths perfectly in our lives, to glorify Jesus Christ by the way we live and to die to our flesh, Father. And Father, give me the health I need right now. Fill my lungs and my chest and my throat and the sound of my voice with the breath of life. And anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father. Your children that are here purchased by the blood of Jesus. And save us from the attacks of the enemy, we beg you. Have your way and bless this session, Father. And remind us we are nothing without you. And you don't need us, we need you. But because you love us, you have made us valuable and give us, given us value. Because you've created us in your image, the image of your son and the image of your spirit. Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Yahweh Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. 
<clears throat> even though for years I would pronounce the divine name as Yahweh, I have been convinced by the research of ne Nehemiah or Nehemiah. He calls himself Nehemiah. It's Nehemiah, but he pronounces it Nehemiah Gordon. I'm convinced by his research. I haven't studied his material with great depth, but that which I've heard, the little that I've heard, he's convinced me that the correct pronunci pronunciation of the divine name as the Lord Jesus loosens my tongue is Yahovah because he's discovered sources, medieval, rabbinic, Jewish sources showing that the rabbis know how to pronounce the name. They never lost the pronunciation of the name. They just kept, kept it hidden, right? But they've always known how to pronounce the name. It's in their sources. And he documents it. So you can watch him on YouTube with Nehemiah, Nehemiah or Nehemiah Gordon, pronunciation of the divine name. Yahovah. Yahovah. Right? Yep. Nehemiah Gordon. He cites medieval rabbinic sources showing that the rabbis knew the correct pronunciation of the divine name, and they would share it with their initiates, but kept it hidden from outsiders. So I'm a believer. That means, folks, Jehovah is the correct Anglo-Saxon or Anglicized pronunciation of the divine name. Did you know that? Jehovah is the correct Anglicized way of pronouncing the Hebrew name of God, Yahovah. Yahovah. And Protestant believer, thank you, brother. For posting the link to Nehemiah, he pronounces Nehemiah. Oh my goodness, Cat! You know you're leaving, right? You can't stay. You gotta go. Okay. Protestant believer, thank you for posting the link and serving us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Cat, you gotta go. You know that, right? You're not gonna stay. No, no, no. You're you're gonna leave for that comment. I have to be Jewish. In order to emphasize the correct pronunciation of the name, last time I checked, Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. His blessed mother was a Jewish woman. His followers, his first followers were Jews. And all the books of the New Testament, with the exception of Luke and Acts, were written by Jews. But since you have a problem with being Jewish, you got to go, Cat. Okay. Bye bye, Cat. No, you're going to be obsolete from my channel. Bye bye. Hold on, sorry. These people don't learn, do they? They really don't learn. Okay, in Jesus' name, let's begin. Yes, we got everyone here. I'm hoping... Who asked me that question yesterday? Who asked me that question yesterday? Someone asked me. Well, I thought God the Father cannot be seen, so I decided, you know what? You know what? Let me just answer it one final time for my YouTube channel. It will be archived so I don't have to answer this question again. Yeah, I think so. Hopefully the buffering won't act up in Jesus' name. Yeah, it is. I know. It's going to buffer. It's all right. Yep. Yeah, well, because whether we like it or not, and I have no problem with it, I have no problem. Jesus is God Almighty who became a Jewish man. He became a Jewish man, whether we like it or not, and you shouldn't have a problem with it. Why would you have a problem? And no matter what ethnicity Jesus becomes, someone would complain. If he became a Syrian, then non-Assyrians would say, why a Syrian? If he became Indian, so that's the whole point. Jesus, in his human nature, is a Jew from the tribe of Judah, a physical son of David. He's Jewish. Hebrews 7, 14. Our Lord came from Judah. Revelation 5.5. 5. Jesus is the line of the tribe of Judah and the root of David. Revelation 22.16. Our Lord Jesus Christ in glory says, I am right now, not I was, I am the root and offspring of David. I am the root and offspring of David. So I don't know why would people would have a problem with that. So obviously, 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 I'm going to be appealing to the Hebrew language 
because the mother tongue of the Jews happens to be Hebrew. The Hebrew Bible is written in Hebrew. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. Obviously, we're going to have to deal with Hebrew names. Okay. Let me just muzzle this dog here. Hold on. We got a dog here that I got a muzzle. He says he's on my page. So I'm trying to see where he's at. All right. Sorry, man. I hope it doesn't. Pray the internet connectivity stays strong. Hold on. Sorry, guys. We got another heretic, a oneness son of Satan who denies he's a oneness, but that's what he is. Man, I get tired of muzzling people. Seriously, it gets tiring. Okay. Until he identifies himself, until he identifies, let's get into. The passages the passages that are often quoted to prove that god the father cannot be seen exodus chapter 33 verse 20 write these down okay exodus 33 verse 20 you ready write these down exodus 33 verse 20 john chapter 1 verse 18 and i trust holy spirit to give me recall of these passages and wisdom to interpret them correctly for the glory of christ so write down john 1 18 John 5 37 <clears throat> John 5 37 John 6 46 first John 4 12 okay did you guys write them down Exodus 33 20 John 1 verse 18 John 5 37 yep there goes the oneness heretic the son of Satan James Satchel who denies he's a oneness Guys, do you give me a couple of minutes to barbecue this clown that I have no respect for? You guys ready? Can I bar brought us in? You ready for me to barbecue this clown? No, it's okay. No, I, I invited him here. Don't worry about it. I invited him here because he's going to be a taste, uh, test study, a guinea pig. Okay. Now, James, I want you to tell everyone what do you believe about Jesus and his relationship to the Father? Make sure you are direct and to the point. You don't tap dance because I'm going to muzzle you if you do. Hey, how you doing, James Knapp? You're 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 here for the barbecue. Okay. Hold on. Let me see what he's going to say. Let's see how long this guy's going to last. Let's see if he's going to answer questions directly. Hey, what's up, Andrew? How you doing, buddy? Side note. You see the gentleman, James Knapp? Uh, Isaiah 9.6 doesn't tell me what you believe about Jesus because father of eternity is not the same thing as God the father I already corrected you don't repeat the same mistake before I embarrass you what do you believe about Jesus's relationship to the father is he God the father in the flesh and by the way James Knapp is one of the leading scholars of the text of the New Testament I highly encourage that you hook up with him go to his YouTube channel subscribe to it watch his videos he provides some of the best defenses for the authenticity of Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, and John 7, verse 53, to chapter 8, verse 11. He does wonderful work in correcting the misinformation of James White and Daniel Wallace. And no disrespect to Daniel Wallace. I love the brother, right? But he corrects the misinformation spread by them, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And because of this man, God has strengthened my confidence in the authenticity of those passages. And by the way, he's not a King James only advocate, nor is he a received text guy. He's not Texas Receptus only, not even majority text, Byzantine text. He just tries to be as faithful as possible to the evidence. So if you want to hear the other side that you don't hear from modern textual critics, James Snap is the guy that you need to listen to and read. Go to his blog. He's also written two books ebooks on amazon the authenticity right okay uh james satchel i'm not going to expose and embarrass you for everyone to see quote one greek philosopher before the time of christ and during the time of the early church that said that god is three persons in one essence because you said it's greek philosophy cite one of the greek philosophers whether it's plotinus or or Aristotle, or Socrates, or who, you name it, where they define God as existing in three persons in one essence. 
But then I'm going to turn it against you, James. I'm going to muzzle you for everyone to hear. Are you aware that your view that Jesus is the Father actually is closer to Greek philosophy than what I believe? Because basically, you're saying Jesus is an emanation of the Father. And that smacks of Gnosticism, where you have the Pleroma and the Aeon. So now it's going to bust in your face to show that you're the pagan child of Satan. See how stupid you look? Sorry, James Knapp. I treat a fool according to his folly. Yep. Get his book, James Knapp's book. Okay. So now James Satchel, bow wow, quote a source, a Greek philosopher that said God, Theos, is three persons in one essence because you said it's Greek philosophy. Quickly. James Satchel, don't waste my time. I'm going to muzzle you. Quote a source. Anthony is too intelligent to stoop to your level and dirty himself with a swine like you. But I like to get dirty. James Satchel, quote a source. A non-Christian Greek philosopher that defined God as three persons in one essence. You're wasting my time. Don't worry, I'm gonna I'm gonna muzzle him, friends. It's not gonna take long, and then I'm gonna block him. And people wonder why I treat these these dogs the way they deserve to be treated. Yeah. Sorry, guys. It won't last too long. James Satchel, as you're now doing a Google search to get your answer. <clears throat> I want everyone to hear what you said. Jesus is God the Father in the flesh, right? Jesus is God the Father in the flesh, right? Walter, I'm going to get more upset with you even faster if you chime in. You don't like it, leave, Walter. Bye-bye. Don't forget to write, Walter. Send me a postcard from Hawaii. Okay. James Satchel, Google is not going to help you, save you from your embarrassment. You got a minute to answer. You believe Jesus is God the Father in the flesh, right? No, he's getting it from Google, Sheikh Google. Bye-bye, Walter, and I pray God blesses you too. No, soldier of Christ, you haven't been mocked. Okay, he's wasting my time here. Uh, James Knapp, yeah, this guy... He's going to tell you that God is omnipresent so he can manifest in three different ways and deceive us into thinking they're different persons. His God is a deceiver. That's why I said his God is Satan, the father of all lies. Okay, James Satchel is wasting my time, so let's send him on his merry way. Let's muzzle this guy. Hold on. Sorry. So what happens when someone tries to wax up? No, James, you didn't hear my question. See, there goes the tap dance. You're like your father, the devil. Show me where Greek philosophers said God is three persons in one essence. Everyone, everyone and their mother had to speak in Greek philosophical categories because even the Arians and the Gnostics, your spiritual forebears, appealed to Greek philosophy to communicate because that was part and parcel of the language of the day. You couldn't help but to express your beliefs in Greek philosophical categories. That shows that you're an illiterate buffoon, that you don't know what you're talking about. So let me make it easy again for you to answer before I send you to bounce.com. Show me any Greek philosopher who's not a Christian that said God is three persons in one essence. Cite the Greek philosopher. Whether Aristotle, Socrates, Plotinus, name them, cite them. You got less than a minute. You see how easy it is to muzzle these dogs? Sorry, guys. Thank you, Bill Thompson. He's actually influenced by Greek philosophy. Do you know why, Bill Thompson? Because he believes that the Jesus is an emanation, a manifestation of the Father. That's Gnosticism where you have the pleroma and the aeon, the emanations, right? So he's a pagan Gnostic son of Satan, and then he thinks he's a Christian. 
Okay. Guys, count 30 and down because we're going to muzzle this guy because he can't answer questions. 30, 29. Okay. Abdul Aziz, don't let me muzzle you too. He doesn't say he's the father. And just because the father's in him doesn't make Jesus the father any more than Jesus in me makes me the father. What's up, Vocab? What's up, brother? Uh, friend, if I could get you on in to speak, I would. But answer the question. And you can set it up sometime during the week. I'll come on your channel and muzzle you and embarrass you for your YouTube channel. Answer the question. Go ahead, guys. Yeah. All right. Okay. Waste of time. Okay. Bye-bye, Miss American Pie. Draw my Chevy to the levee. L levee was dry. Good old boys was drinking whiskey and wine. Set up a discussion on your channel. I'll promise I'll come there and embarrass you for your subscribers and muzzle you for the glory of Christ. Praise the Lord Jesus. All right. All right, guys. Now that we got rid of these nuisances and these Bible perverts, now we can focus. Amen? Yeehaw! Howdy! Okay. Let's get into it. Uh, Sunan, I have an article on it. An article... On my blog, what it means for Jesus to be called Aviad, Aviad. It doesn't mean he's God the Father. He is the Father of eternity, and I explain it thoroughly in my article, so check it out. Now, let's go into the topic. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Are you guys ready? Okay. Does the Bible teach that God the Father cannot be seen? No, it doesn't. Does the Bible show that God the Father can be seen? Yes, it does. I'm going to give you the references, but we'll look at them a little later because I'm going to go to the passages that are typically used to show that God the Father cannot be seen visibly, even though that's not what the passages teach. And you have James Knapp. He knows the Greek. You can correct me here, and I'll correct him right back, even though I love him. <laughs> but just note Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to 10, verses 13 to 14. Write these down. We're going to come back. Uh, James, dude, what's wrong with you, bro? I'm going to go to James John 1, 18 and show you doesn't mean what you think it means, man. I love you, bro. Stick with textual criticism. Okay, player? John 1, 18 doesn't even say that. And you know that better than I because of the Greek word. And you know that the Greek word doesn't mean see with the eye. It can also mean perceive with the mind, see with the mind. And you know contextually that's the meaning because, James, you know that it goes on to say that the son exegeted him. The Greek word for exegete. So it's clearly referring to knowing, understanding, perceiving the nature of God. Not so much seeing God visibly. That's the contextual meaning of John 1.18. Player James. Oh, snap. Okay. No, I know that, brother. I know, no, no. I know that, James. I'm playing with you. Come on, James. You know me. You know I like to play games. Come on now. Oh, snap. Exactly. See what I mean? Do you see my point? Yeah, I see your point. Well, you mean you saw it physically? Did my point, what was it, 5 foot 10 inches, 200 pounds? No, meaning I perceive, I understand. Pat out. Okay, let's go with John 118 then. But now write down, guys, let's focus. Let's focus in Jesus' name so I can go into the meat of the matter. Write down Daniel 7, 9 to 10, and 13 to 14. We're going to look at those later. Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10, and verses 13 to 14. And write down Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Write those down because if you read Daniel 7, God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, appear visibly to Daniel in his vision. Because God the Father is the Ancient of Days that Daniel sees seated on one of the thrones. And he sees God the Father with a head with white woolen hair and a white robe. So that's a visible manifestation of God the Father. We know that's God the Father because later on he sees the Son of Man approaching the Ancient of Days. And the New Testament tells us that Son of Man is Jesus, which means the Son of Man, if that's Jesus, then the Ancient of Days cannot be Jesus. It must be God the Father. So there, Daniel sees God the Father visibly and the Son visibly. Did you guys get that? So he sees the Father and the Son appear visibly don't take my word for it read it now someone will say oh yeah you can see god the father in a vision however none of the passages that they quote 
say no one can see God except in a vision. It simply says no one can see God, period. So be consistent. Either you can't see God altogether or you can see God in some sense because none of the passages that are quoted say you cannot see God the Father except in a vision. You with me there? John 1.18 doesn't say no one can, has seen God except in a vision or a dream. It simply says no one has seen God, period. Uh, James, you're not refuting anything because John 1.18 does not say that God can be seen in a vision for the sake of communicating, right, a particular spiritual point about the nature of God. It simply says God can't be seen. The fact now that you're qualifying it means you don't take the passage at face value and you're proving my point, James. So thank you for proving my point. You just proved my point that you have to qualify the meaning of John 1.18 to include this categorization of visualization so that God can communicate something about himself in a vision, although it's God still appearing visibly in a vision. And James, your definition of vision is troubling because Paul says that when Jesus appeared to him, he appeared to him in a vision. Are you denying that this was an actual appearance of Christ, though Paul classified it as a vision? James Knapp, Acts 26.19. Did Jesus really actually appear to Paul in time and space? James Knapp? Because Paul called that encounter a vision in Acts 26, 19. So I think you're trying to prove too much, and it's going to backfire against you, my brother. No disrespect. But anyway, Exodus 33, 20. Exodus 33, 20. Let's go and read that. Let's start with that. Are we ready? Uh, Danny, uh, James, you're not getting the point. Paul says what he saw when he saw Jesus, it's a vision, just like Daniel called it a vision. There is no difference in what Daniel said he saw because he called it a vision from what Paul saw because James, Paul says it was a vision. So be consistent. Don't define vision one way when it comes to Daniel, but then define it in a different way when it comes to Paul in order to to prove your point because you're putting the cart before the horse and you're begging the question. You keep trying, James. Like I said, out of love for you, I love you. Stick with textual criticism. No, I'm bringing up Paul. See, James, you still don't get it. You just argue that a vision somehow doesn't conflict with John 1.18 that says God can't be seen, though it doesn't qualify it. It doesn't say God can't be seen unless it's in a vision. And then when I told you that Paul saw Jesus in a vision, which you won't deny it was a real encounter with Christ, now we're all over the place. So let's cut to the chase and make it simple. Where does John 1.18 say, James, that God cannot be seen except in a vision? Let's cut to the chase and let's not go, go in circles. James, show me in John 1.18 it says, no one can see God except in a vision. In order to exempt Daniel from having seen God, although it's in a vision, and the visionary experience doesn't deny the reality of seeing God any more than Paul seeing Jesus in a vision denies the reality of him seeing the risen Christ. So no such qualification exists in John 1.18, though you're trying to make it <clears throat> appear as such because... John 1.18 at face value says you cannot see God, period, end the story. It doesn't say except in a vision or a dream. But now, let's come back. Let's come back to Exodus 33.20. With that said, let's come back to Exodus 33.20. Everyone with me here? Okay, let's read Exodus 33.20. Now, guys, I need you to pay attention. Exodus 33.20. You ready? Let's read Exodus 33.20. One more time, focus now. I'm going to take it passage by passage. Okay. This is a passage also that used to prove that you cannot see God the Father. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Thou canst see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. So here this passage is quoted to show, see, you can't see the face of God the Father. Even for argument's sake. Guys, I need you to pay attention now. Help me to help you by paying attention to the passage. Even if I were to interpret that passage in that sense, that you cannot see the face of God the Father. <clears throat> okay. 
James, you can ask Daniel what animal coat God's garment is made of because that doesn't refute the fact that God appeared to him in a visible form. So, James, let me play your game. Did God the Father appear visibly to Daniel, yes or no? Hold on, hold on. Let me. I got an out of love school my friend James because he's trying too hard to win an argument, which he often does, even when it comes to issues he brings up in textual criticism. But now I'm going to bring it on. Let's now take off the gloves. James, even in the vision, did God the Father appear visibly? Let's play your game. It doesn't tell me what animal coat. doesn't matter, but it was a coat nonetheless. Did Daniel see God the Father visibly? Yes or no? Hold on. Let me play his game. Let me stoop down and play his game. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, that's irrelevant to my question, James. Please answer questions directly. Did Daniel see God the Father visibly in a vision? Now watch. I'm going to turn it against him. Watch. Okay. James, don't waste my time and answer my questions directly. Boring. Hold on. There goes Hater Wood. James, did God the Father appear visibly to Daniel in a vision? Yes or no? Uh, did you catch it? You see how I can't answer? Now, James, you're really disappointing me. Here I propped you up, and now you're tap dancing like a good Muslim, and you're not a Muslim. Let me ask the question a third time, James, because I know you're scared to answer, but don't worry. You will answer because you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to run. Did God the Father appear to Daniel in a vision? No, he's scared now. That's okay. I'm going to have fun at his expense. Go ahead, James. You're not going to get anywhere by avoiding my, my questions directly. And I didn't say physically. I said visibly. Do you know the difference, James, between physical and visible? Did he appear visibly? Okay. Now, James, did God Daniel see Jesus as the Son of Man riding the clouds in verses 13 and 14, yes and no. James, you're going to answer directly because uh, now you're on the hot seat. You're trying to grill me. I'm going to now grill you. Did Daniel see Jesus Christ in Daniel 7, 13 and 14 in a vision? Now, James, according to the New Testament, is Jesus actually a son of man who actually rides the clouds of heaven? Or is that simply a visualization aid that's not meant to be literal or physical? James, let me repeat my question so you answer directly. According to the New Testament, is Jesus actually the son of man who actually rides the clouds of heaven? So that when Daniel saw him in a vision, it wasn't simply a visualization aid, but he actually saw Jesus as he actually is, as he actually appears, as he actually is physically, according to the New Testament. So that means yes. You see, guys, how James just refuted himself? Just because it's in a vision doesn't mean it's not a reality. Did you see how James just refuted himself? You see how I just set him up? Do you guys see it? Just because it's a vision doesn't mean that they're not seeing God in actual visible form. Thank you, James. Now, if you want to keep wasting my time and debating this point, I can go all night. We can dance. Okay. Now, my third question to you, James. Third question. Can you show me in John? No, you don't see it, but we do. That's your problem because you've made up your mind, so you don't want us to confuse you with the facts. If what Daniel saw in verses 13, 14 is the actual appearance of Jesus, what grounds contextually are you going to deny that he's seen God in an actual visible form? Don't attack straw man, James. I'm not saying that God is an act actually an old man. With a white robe. I'm saying that God the Father can appear visibly in a form by which you can behold him. Because God by nature is invisible. There's nothing to see. But that would be true of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So James, if it doesn't follow, it's because you don't want to see it. The problem is with your vision, pun intended. 
And you got busted, James, and I love you. Okay, so let's try it again. Who said anything about a future event? I'm saying that Daniel actually saw God visibly in a vision and actually saw the sun in a vision. And I'm going to flip it on you. Since Jesus quotes Daniel 7 in reference to his heavenly enthronement, you're telling me Daniel did not see the future? So you don't believe that God can show prophets future events before they take place? Let me flip it back on you and let's have fun at your expense. So you're telling me that Jesus's application of Daniel 7, 13 to 14, which he ties it in with his heavenly enthronement, which Daniel saw six centuries before it took place. So Daniel wasn't given a vision of the future, even though the entire chapter of Daniel 7 is about future kingdoms and their destruction. Really, James, you really want to go there? You know, you're wasting my time now, right, James? Okay. And Paul had a vision of the risen Christ. Acts 26, 19. Now, James, when Paul had a vision of the risen Christ, was he seeing the actual Christ in actual time and space? Acts 26, 19. Okay. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to help my brother James and my love to stick with textual criticism, not with exegesis. Acts 26, 19. James. He says he was not unfaithful to the vision. Okay, so then... Paul said he saw the risen Jesus, which qualifies him as an apostle like Peter and James and John. But Peter, James, and John saw the risen Christ in time and space on earth. So are you saying that when Paul had the vision of the risen Christ, he didn't actually see Jesus as he actually is in heaven because it was a vision? Raphael, hold on. I can't block James Snap because he's my senior who's a scholar of the New Testament text. And I love and respect him when it comes to textual criticism. But we all have to know our limitations and not venture into other categories that we're not experts in. And that's what I'm trying to help him see. He's not an expert in exegesis, even though he may think he is. Okay. Now, James, here's my other question so I can return to the subject. And thank you for engaging me because you helped me prove my point and refute your argument. James, can you show me in John 1, 18 where it says no one can see God except in a vision? Uh, James, I don't think you know what you're talking about because what Paul saw of Jesus wasn't just personal to him because you know the accounts. You know that even the others saw the light heard the voice, they couldn't understand it. So what Paul called the vision wasn't something true only to his mind's eye. It was something that the others also saw because they saw the light, heard the voice, but could not understand what the voice was saying because he was speaking in Aramaic. James, do you really understand what you're saying? But now let's go with your definition. James, let me have fun at your expense again out of love. Okay, guys, let me, let me just go with what he just said. Plus, a personal vision of Jesus is not the same as the issue at hand. Yes, it is. Folks, do you see how he's attacking straw man and he's setting up categories in order to avoid dealing with the massive amount of evidence that's refuting him? Who said it's not the same? Your ipse dixit because you said so? Because you say it's not the same, it's not the same? You're not a prophet. You're not God. What you say is or isn't the same doesn't matter. It is the same, James. But James, let me play your game. Can you show me in John 1.18 your qualification? Where does John 1.18 say, no one can see God, right, except God the Father, except, right, <clears throat> if it's a personal vision given to a person that only he can see. Can you show me where John 1.18 makes your qualification? Because we're wasting time here, James. Yeah, he's a Trinitarian.
Show me where John 1 18 made your qualification. That no one can see God the Father except if it's a personal vision that only the person sees in his mind's eye. Show me where it qualified it that way like you do to avoid dealing with the passage that refutes your misinterpretation of what it means that God cannot be seen. Say, I'm playing your game. I'm stooping down to your level and playing your game. And it's not faring well for you, brother. Okay. Let's see how he answers. I'm going to give him two more questions, see if he answers. If not, then we're going to. Uh... Okay. James, let's try it again. Show me where John 1.18 says, no one can see God the Father except if it's a personal vision to a specific person where only he sees it in his mind's eye. Where does John 1.18 make that qualification? In order for you to avoid the fact that Daniel did see God the Father, albeit in a vision, just like Paul saw Jesus in a vision. And I'm going to give you another example. But John 1.18 didn't make the qualification you're making to avoid dealing with the implication of Daniel seeing God the Father and John also seeing God the Father. I, I think my questions are clear. Everyone's getting it, James. Okay. Where did John 1.18 say no one can see God the Father except if it's a personal vision to a specific person that only he sees? Please, for the love of God, show me your qualification in that passage. We're all getting it, James, so don't play games and saying it doesn't follow, and it follows, and we're getting it perfectly. You don't want to get it because you can't deal with the evidence that refutes your tradition that you impose on the text. Uh, no, you won't because it's not there, Raphael. Try and you'll fail because that's what I'm going to do. No, uh, James, you're not answering my question. John 1.18 says no one can see God, which is misinterpreted to mean that God the Father cannot be seen, period. I just showed you that Daniel saw God the Father in visible form. You try to evade the force of that vision by saying, well, it's a vision. And then you try to mock. What was his uh, uh, coat made of? What animal? See, your mockery is going to end up embarrassing you, James, because, again, I go tit for tat. So now I'm going to play your game. And I'm going to mock you right at, right back. John, where does John 1.18 say, James? No one can see God the Father except in a vision. You still did not answer my question. You're wasting my time, James. Let's try it again. James is providing a test study for every one of you to see. You, guys, now... See, again, James thinks he's the authority, and if he says it, it's got to be matter-of-factly. Is it a valid question to ask me what kind of <clears throat> robe God is wearing in a vision? Is that a valid question, or is that simply mockery, sarcasm, in order to avoid dealing with the force of the evidence that exposes his man-made tradition and his inability to deal with the passages in context? It doesn't have to be made of any animal skin, James, unless you believe God is limited where he cannot manifest a robe that's not made of any animal skin. See now, James, you see, one, one person just said, your argument is stupid. Let me try it again, James. You're really wasting my time and you are tiring me out. You're wearing out my patience. For the 10th time, I'm going to ask you, James, where does John 1.18 say, uh, Raphael? That's not about the Father. It's about Jesus. Don't misquote 1 Timothy 6, 15 to 16 again. James, one more time. One more time. Where does John 1.18 say no one has can see God the Father except in a vision? This is now the 20th time. And guys, did you hear me say... That Daniel's vision is more than a vision. You see the straw man? James, brother, you're disappointing me and you're embarrassing yourself. The only reason why I quoted Daniel 7 is to show that Daniel saw God. Guys, can you bear witness? Did I ever say Daniel's vision is more than a vision? Did you ever hear me say Daniel's vision is more than a vision? 
Okay. So, James, this is embarrassing coming from a scholar of your caliber to attack straw man because you can't deal with the force of the weight that refutes your man-made tradition. Let me now repeat the second point. Folks, did Daniel see Jesus in a vision in Daniel 7, 13 and 14, a vision in which he saw Jesus as he actually appears and looks like? In Daniel 7, 13 and 14, when Daniel sees one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, according to New Testament, does Jesus actually look like that? Son of Man who rides the clouds. No, actually, you need to go back and listen and stop imposing your misunderstanding of what people are saying into their words because now I'm really going to think twice about recommending you because you have a habit of doing this. Even when I try to correct you on the comma, you take your statements as infallible truth where you had to read the statement of someone coming in the 600s back into Cyprian's statement and you couldn't see the chronological fallacy in the argument and insisted you're right because you're blinded by your own ipse dixit. And at the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter will be settled. So let me ask, folks, you've been listening to me carefully. Did you hear me say anywhere in this discussion that Daniel's vision is more than a vision? I want to now call this guy out for bearing false witness because now he really disappointed me. So, James, either I'm going to say you're ignorant, you don't understand, or now you're lying and you're bearing false witness. Now, for the sake of charity, I'm going to say you're ignorant, you didn't understand. Don't ever misrepresent me, brother. Okay. Yeah. No, we're not. I'm just showing how your MO is. Once you made up your mind, it's gospel truth. You can't be wrong, even though you're wrong, and you're the only one who sees that you're not wrong. Now, let me try it again. Ipsit Dixit. Okay, let me try it again. James, for everyone else, help James along. When Daniel saw Jesus as the Son of Man in Daniel 7, 13 to 14, riding the clouds, does Jesus actually look like that? Does he actually look like a Son of Man? And does he actually ride the clouds of heaven? Even though it's a vision. Daniel 7, 13 to 14. So do you see the foolishness and the fallacy of James' logic? Just because it's a vision, why does this deny the reality of God appearing visibly, even though it's in a vision, when Daniel sees Jesus in a vision and sees Jesus as he actually appears and looks like? What does vision have to do with it? My final challenge to James, and I'm going to put him on ignore, James, when Moses and Elijah and Jesus all showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration and James, John, and Peter saw them and then the cloud came down and they heard the voice of God saying, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Did James, John, and Peter see something actual? Did they actually see Moses and Elijah and Jesus transfigured and actually were overshadowed by a cloud? Was that actual, James? Was that actual, James? Yes or no? No, I want James to answer because it's not going to turn, turn back against him. <clears throat> Did Peter, James, and John actually see Jesus transfigured on the mount? Were they on an actual mount? and actually see Moses and Elijah, and actually see the cloud come down on them, and actually heard the voice saying, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Was it actual, James? Yes or no? Don't delay the answer, because you know where I'm going with this, and it's not going to bode well for you. Oh, but Matthew 17, verse 9, says it was a vision. James, it was a vision. Matthew 17, verse 9. So can we stop the nonsense already, James? Matthew 17, verse 9. Post it for me, folks. Go ahead, Protestant. Matthew 17, verse 9. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man. Bam, James. Peter, James, and John actually saw Moses and Elijah, actually saw Jesus transfigure, actually saw the cloud come down, and actually heard the voice of God speak to them, and yet, Jesus says it was a vision. So your entire argument is moot. You're saying nothing but wasting our time. Thank you, James. 
Now, James, can I now return to my discussion? Oh, but you just said they actually saw these figures, even though it's a vision. So now what was your argument, James, that Daniel saw God the Father in a vision and somehow that's not actual? You just refuted yourself and destroyed your argument. Thank you, James. Guys, send James a rose. Thank you, James. Send him a rose. Purple roses. Okay, thank you, James. Now, James, I just wasted 20 minutes correcting your bad theology and misinterpretation of Scripture. And in love, I say this. Don't take it personally. Stick with textual criticism. Exegesis is not your forte. Just like textual criticism isn't my forte. James, I say this humbly. You're not an exegete. Stick with textual criticism. You wouldn't be able to argue yourself out of a paper bag if it came to exegesis of Scripture. Stick with textual criticism. And I say this lovingly. You may take it personally. That's fine. You're not an exegete. Okay? Leave the exegesis to us. Okay, are we ready now? Now, you guys, did you learn? By the way, you learn now, right? You learn. He God provided another opportunity how to refute those who in their desperation do not want to admit that God the Father has been seen. Right? So I'm glad he came. This was God's timing and providence. Now let's go back to Exodus 3320. Thank you, James, for being used of the Lord to show people why this argument that God the Father can't be seen is unscriptural. And people who don't want to admit that God the Father has been seen have to tap dance and misinterpret scripture, even though they have good intentions in doing so. Thank you, brother. Stick with textual criticism. And I say this honestly. Exegesis is not your forte. You will not succeed in, as an exegete. All right. uh, James, you can set up a dialogue on your channel. Don't use that as a, a pathetic excuse. Here, I'm going to call you out. Set up a dialogue on your channel. We'll go back and forth with equal time. We'll see how well you do. So don't make an excuse to save face. James, my brother, you got busted. Be humble and accept correction. It's not your forte. Set it up, James, and we'll see if you'll do any better when it's live, face-to-face, -face, interaction between you and me. Okay, brother? Now, respect the rest of the crew. Sit back and listen and learn. Stick to textual criticism. Don't you love it? When they lose, they say, well, keep in mind, I only have a 200-word limit. Set up a dialogue. I'm calling you out. Anyway, are we ready, guys? Don't you love it? Keep in mind, it's 200 words. Okay, then why are you chiming in? James, if it's only 200 word limits, why are you chiming in if it's not an ego fest that you have to prove you're right? And you're not going to prove you're right. Set up a live discussion, you and me, back and forth, and I promise you, you won't do any better. That's my promise to you, James, by the grace of the triune God. Stick to textual criticism, brother. Okay? Yep. No, I'm not. Actually, I'm, I have to. Then if it's better than nothing, don't complain when you got school, James. Now, James, you're now disrupting. Brother, I don't want to have to block you. So out of respect, eat some humble pie and just listen. When it comes to textual criticism, I let you speak and pontificate. Exegesis, you won't make it as an exegete. I promise you, you won't. All right. Okay. Now, I want everyone to send him a rose to show that we still love James. We love you, James. We love you. All right, now are you ready? Man, I already, how many minutes was this? How many minutes? Are you guys okay, though, for the rest of you? Sorry I had to go back and forth with this, brother, because I had to. Because, again, and I just want to remind everyone, we're not all going to be experts in every field of Christianity. Something that is humble is to know your limitations. Know your limitations and don't venture into areas and pontificate in areas that you are not gifted in or studied in. And this is why I'm saying, you can be offended at this. Stick with textual criticism. Don't venture into exegesis of these passages or even dealing with Muslims. That's not your forte. Just like I won't venture into textual criticism. That's not my forte. I defer to the experts like you. That's the humble thing to do. Okay? Thank you. And I know Hater Wood just loved this. 
<laughs> hater would love this. Okay. You loved it, hater would. Okay, anyway. Let's go to Exodus 3320. Hold on. Exodus 3320. Hold on. One second. <laughs> okay, let's go. God bless you, James. Lord, use you in textual criticism to strengthen the body. Exodus 3320. Let's read it. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. This is another passage used to show God the Father can't be seen, right? How many of you have quoted this or have someone quoted it to you to show God the Father can't be seen? Right? This is cited as proof God the Father can't be seen. All right. Even if I grant this is saying that God the Father's face can't be seen, the passage says you can see his backward parts. Let's read Exodus 33. Let's read 18 to 23. Now I need your undivided attention. Focus on the passages. Okay. Let's read. Even if I were to grant that this is speaking of God the Father, can't his face can't be seen. It doesn't say that God the Father can't be seen in any sense. If I were to take it the way it's being interpreted, it means that you can't see God's face, but you can see his backward parts. Well, what does that mean? Does God literally have a face? And does he have backward parts? Is it literal? Well, let's look at it. First, let's read. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of Jehovah before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And Jehovah said, Jehovah said, Behold, there's a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I'll put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Folks, this passage doesn't prove you cannot see God the Father in any sense. It only proves you can't see the face of God the Father, but you can see his back parts. So even this passage that's misinterpreted, misapplied, doesn't see, say you cannot see God the Father in any sense. And I'm not even saying it's about God the Father. I'm not saying it's about God the Father. I'm arguing the objection raised by the anti-Trinitarian. I'm assuming their argument. Their argument is, see, God the Father can't be seen. And they quote Exodus 33.20, right? Okay, hold on. It doesn't say God the Father can't be seen. It says... His face can't be seen, but you can see his back parts. So now how many people want to now admit you can see God the Father in some sense? It's just his face you can't see, but you can see a part of him. How does this passage prove you cannot see God the Father in any sense? You see my point now? So why would anyone quote this passage to show God the Father can't be seen? Right? Here we go with the visitation given to Moses, the essence of God is spirit. Oh my goodness. Okay, guys. I don't I really think James is not getting it. Okay, James, before Jesus became flesh, he existed as God. And as God, is he spirit? Let me help James understand the argument because he's really not getting it. Before Jesus became flesh, Jesus as God, is he spirit? So he can't help it. James says, okay, but he can't. He has a chance. Okay, James. And then he says, oh, 200 word limits. All right. So damn if you do, damn if you don't. Guys, hold on. James, before Jesus became flesh, he existed as God. And as God, is he spirit too? Does John 4, 24 also apply to him? That's why I say stick to textual criticism, James. 
It's not going to help you, but I'm going to entertain you because I want others to learn from you. I'm waiting for the answer, James, because we already wasted a lot of time. No, Lopez, because it's James bringing the objection. Oh, no, notice you see the tap dance. Oh, but possible exceptions. Though Jesus wasn't flesh in the Old Testament, he is God in spirit, but there are theophanies. Thank you for proving my point again, James. Just because God the Father is spirit doesn't mean he cannot manifest visibly any more than Jesus being spirit during the Old Testament and not flesh denied the ability of Christ to appear visibly. What in the world are you arguing? Because you're not refuting anything. Let's try this another time. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not flesh, right, James? And you believe he's God. So the Holy Spirit, as God, is spirit, right, James? And the nuanced answer I'm giving you doesn't bode well for you. James, the Holy Spirit is God who is spirit as well, correct? But yet the Holy Spirit appears visibly. Luke 3.22. Luke 3.22. And don't tell me it's a visualization where only John saw it. Luke 3.22. Yeah, it's clear I'm wasting time here with James. Luke 3, 22, let's read it. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. So the Holy Spirit, who is God, he is spirit too. And yet that doesn't hinder the Holy Spirit from appearing visibly in a shape of some kind, though by nature he's spirit and shapeless. Luke 3, 22, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I am well pleased. Who saw the Holy Spirit in bodily shape? John 1, 32 to 33. John 1, 32 to 33. John 1, 32 to 33. Exactly, King of Kings, because I've been there and done that. Right? Okay, now read John 1, 32, 33. Guys, notice who saw the Holy Spirit appear in bodily shape. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. The same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Now, guys, let's follow James Snap's logic because I don't think he gets it. God the Father is spirit. Okay. And so what does that mean exactly? That he can't appear in bodily shape or in a form of some kind? But hold on, James Snap. Before Jesus became flesh, he too as God is spirit. But he still was able, able to appear in various shapes and forms. Hold on, James Snap. The Holy Spirit is spirit as well, and he's God. But he also can appear visibly in bodily shape. So what's your objection to God the Father, who though is spirit, can appear visibly in a shape or a form of some kind? What's your objection? Because you are refuting nothing but wasting our time. Did everyone else get it? Everyone got it, right? Because I don't want him to make an excuse. Well, it doesn't follow or it's nuanced or yeah, because that means he can't deal with the objections. James, again, I'm going to say it and I say this humbly. Hold on. Okay. James, I'm going to say it again and I'm going to say it humbly. You're not an exegete. You cannot interpret scripture. Stick with textual criticism. And I say this with respect. Stick with textual criticism. 
Okay, James, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna send you on your merry way, right? Right. You guys see he can't refute the objection. Notice the silly argument. The objection is against the idea that God himself has a bodily form. Now, guys, you see the guy is dishonest now. Now, James, you're dishonest. I just said it for the umpteenth time. Guys, you heard me say that God the Father is spirit. The same way that Jesus, before he became flesh, is spirit. The same way that the Holy Spirit is spirit. And yet I said, like the Son and the Holy Spirit can assume bodily shape, so can the Father appear in bodily shape. Can anyone tell me where I said that God the Father has a body by nature intrinsically? Can anyone tell me where I said that? No, it's actually quite helpful. I know you don't like it. You can't. You're a neophyte when it comes to interpreting scripture, James. The fact that you constantly represented my argument, shame on you because I call you to a higher standard. As it will show, I never said that God by nature has a body. Did anyone hear me say that? So either you're ignorant, and it's your ignorance that's causing you not to understand the point, or you're lying and slandering me. Which is it, James? Which is it, James? The fact is you got embarrassed, you got schooled, because you don't want to admit that God the Father can appear in vis a visible form. The evidence is overwhelming against you, so now you have to backtrack and attack straw man. Oh, but God doesn't have a body. Who said he did? Did I say that God as God has a body, James? I'll give you a million bucks and I'll take you to the mosque and make you become Muslim and take Shahada if you show me where I said that. All right. So are you going to stop with the straw man, James, and stop chiming in? Because you're going to force me to block you, guy. You're going to force me to block you. I'm being honest. And I don't want to do that because I respect your work as a textual critic. But as an exegete, you're not. How can I elaborate on my position when you haven't even let me articulate my position for the last hour, James? Because you keep interjecting, attacking straw man, forcing me to address you. I haven't even addressed the point. How do you want me to address the point, James? For the past hour, you've been on a tangent attacking straw man, throwing out red herrings and being refuted along the way. It's already been over 72 minutes. Now, folks, do you still want me to keep this or do you want me to delete this? Should I just leave this as a lesson, as a test lesson for you guys to learn how to interact with those who try to refute your position but can't do so, so they have to attack straw man, misrepresent you? Okay. Okay, now let me repeat again for the record. So I don't have someone attack straw man and misrepresent my position. <laughs> okay, let me... Uh, James, can you stop telling me what would help and not help? Okay, I want to have people vote. Guys, should we keep James on or should we just remove him from the discussion? How many? Put a one if we remove him, two to let him stay. One to remove, two to stay. Let's see how many. Okay. Well, it's, it seems to be even. All right. Guys, let me articulate my position, which you guys would have heard me if you followed the discussion. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. By nature, and you guys have heard me say this over and over again, right? By nature, the Godhead is immaterial, invisible, formless, shapeless, spaceless, placeless, right? God by nature is invisible. God by nature is in, incorporeal. God by nature is placeless, spaceless, shapeless. That's true of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. However, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit can assume any shape and form 
and can assume multiple shapes and forms and appear in any shape and form to any creature within creation. Is that clear? Does everyone understand the position? Okay. If that's clear, the objection I'm addressing is the assertion that God the Father cannot be seen. Who said he can't be seen? Why can't he be seen? Because if you're telling me that by nature he's spaceless, placeless, immaterial, well, neither can the Holy Spirit be seen because the Holy Spirit as God is also spaceless, placeless, immaterial. Neither could Jesus be seen before he became man because Jesus, in his pre-human existence, exists as God, and as God, he's placeless, spaceless, shapeless, and timeless. So what do you mean God the Father can't be seen? You're saying by nature there's nothing to see? Well, by nature there's nothing to see of either the Father or the Spirit or even the Son in respect to their divine nature. Because as God, Father, Son, and Spirit, as God, don't have shape, don't have form. They're incorporeal, invisible, immaterial. So what are you saying? Now, if you mean God the Father cannot appear visibly in a form and shape of some kind, you'd be wrong. Because God the Father can appear, has appeared, as did Jesus before he became flesh, as does the Holy Spirit. That's the point. Okay, James. So then why do we waste an hour and 20 minutes, dude? Why don't you just ask me, what do I believe about the nature of God? We just wasted an hour, 20 minutes. When you're telling me now you agree with me. Me thinks you agree with me because you got corrected and have to agree with me. Okay. Right? So to answer the objection, oh, James, so you came in late and you, st <laughs> I love you, James. Ah, oh, James, I love you. Ah, oh. nothing but feelings, feelings, oh, feelings, oh, snap. All right. Okay. Okay. So Exodus 33, 20, let's revisit that. Yeah, I'm going to have to do a part two. Okay. Exodus 33, 20. Folks, does that passage say God the Father can't be seen in any sense? Does that say God the Father can't be seen in any sense? Or is it saying there's a sense in which you cannot see God, but there's a sense in which you can? Exodus 33, 23. Exodus 33:23 Tell me why I'm triple B because I don't know. Exodus 33:23 Exodus 33:23 Let's look at it. And I will take away mine hand and thou shalt see my back parts but my face shall not be seen. So, those who misquote this passage to show that God the Father can't be seen Number one, if it's God the Father, God the Father did not say, you can't see me in any sense. Are you with me there? God the Father did not say, you can't see me in any sense. He says, you can't see my face, but you can see my back parts. So that confirms what I said. God the Father can be seen in some sense. James, you, you again, you're pontificating and you're saying nothing. What's there to see of the essence of God when God by nature is invisible? What are you talking about, man? So you got to keep chiming in. James, what's there to see of the essence of God when God by nature is invisible? There's nothing to see. Why do you keep repeating a point that no one is making? Why are you attacking straw man? No, guys, I think we need to send this guy in his merry way. James, I love you. I'll continue to encourage people to read your stuff on textual criticism. This is too much, right? Right? I think this is too much for you, James. What do you think, bro? Do you think you need to go? 
because we wasted everyone's time so I can address you. Right? What do you think, James? Think you need a break? You need to go somewhere? Okay, so I'm going to give him one more chance to see if he can just listen. Okay, so now, guys, Exodus 33.20. Exodus 33.20. Is it clear that if it's God the Father speaking, God the Father does not say you can't see him in any sense. There's a sense in which you can see him. If it is referring God the Father, right? Right? You guys are with me? Everyone with me? If anyone ever quotes Exodus 33.20, if anyone ever quotes Exodus 33.20 and tells you, you see, God the Father can't be seen. Say, no, 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 let me correct you. It says you can't see the face of God the Father, but Exodus 33.23 says you can see his back. So who told you you can't see God the Father in any sense whatsoever? Did you get that first point? Okay. But then it gets even worse for them. Because if you ask them, who's speaking to Moses in Exodus 33.20? Here's where it's going to get bad for them. If you ask them, who's speaking to Moses in Exodus 33.20? If you actually show them the context, they'll tell you it's Jesus Christ. Why? Let's read the context. Exodus 33, 7 to 11. Exodus 33, 7 to 11. Read with me. This is the same chapter. And Moses took the tabernacle, pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought Jehovah went out into the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Read with me. And it came to pass when Moses went out into the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and Jehovah talked with Moses, okay? And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. Now notice verse 11. Verse 11. Okay. And Jehovah spake unto Moses face to face, directly, no angelic mediation, no angel to speak on behalf of God, but God appearing to Moses, speaking to him directly, directly speaking to him, right? Without a mediator. As a man speaketh unto his friend, and he turned again into the camp, but a servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man departed not out of the tabernacle. So now what you tell them is this. Who is this Jehovah that came down in a cloud and appeared to Moses in a cloud, and Moses entered the cloud, and then spoke to God directly in the cloud. Who is the God in the cloud that Moses spoke directly to? You know what they're going to tell you? You know what they're going to tell you? No. They're going to tell you that was Jesus. They're going to tell you it was Jesus. not the. No, 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 no. You're still not getting the argument. The people that use Exodus 33.20 to show that God the Father can't be seen are the same ones who will tell you that it was Jesus that appeared to Moses. It was Jesus that appeared to Moses. Are you with me there? Right? Jesus is the one who appeared in the cloud and spoke to Moses directly. So when Moses entered the cloud, he saw Jesus and spoke to him directly. But guess what, folks? Then who is the one... In Exodus 33.20, telling Moses, you can't see my face. Let's go to Exodus 33.20. Exodus 33.20. Now watch, I'm going to turn it against them. Exodus 33.20. Okay. And he said, thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me live. Question. The same chapter. This is talking about the same Jehovah who came down in the cloud 
by the tent, the same Jehovah that Moses saw in the tent, the same Jehovah that spoke to Moses directly face to face in the tent, that same Jehovah says, you can't see my face. So now if you tell me that's the son, then it's Jesus saying, you can't see my face. You with me there? But if you tell me it's the Father, then you just refute it yourself again because that means the Father did appear in the cloud in some form that Moses saw. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. If that's Jesus in the cloud, then Jesus said to him, you can't see my face, only my back. But if it's the Father that said it, then the Father was the one who was in the cloud who came down and whom Moses saw in the cloud. So which is it? Is it Jesus? Then Jesus said, you can't see my face. If it's the Father, then the Father appeared visibly. He was in the cloud and appeared visibly to Moses. So you can't win either way. If it's Jesus, then I can't even see Jesus. But if it's the Father, then the Father came down in the cloud. Moses went in the cloud and saw someone in the cloud and spoke to him directly. See the problem now? So what do you want to prove from Exodus 33, 20? If you're telling me it's the father who said you can't see my face, then you got two problems. Two problems. Number one, that same chapter, the father says you can see my back parts. So that means you can't see the father in some sense. Number two, the father had already come down in the cloud by the tent and the people saw the cloud. So they know Jehovah's in the cloud. And then Moses went in the cloud and spoke directly to the father. So that means the father did appear in some way to Moses in time and space. But if you're going to tell me that's Jesus who appeared in the cloud, then Jesus said to Moses, you can't see my face. You understand? So don't let anyone misquote Exodus 33, 20 to show that God the Father can't be seen. Because number one, the text doesn't say God the Father can't be seen. It says there's a certain aspect of the Father you can't see, but there's a certain aspect you can see. Because in that same chapter where he says you can't see my face, you'll see my back parts, but not my face. And that same chapter has God the Father coming down in a cloud. The people saw the cloud. They didn't see the figure in the cloud. But Moses entered the cloud, saw the figure, and spoke to him face to face. And if you're going to tell me that's God the Father, that means he saw God the Father. You with me there? But if you're going to say no, it was Jesus that came down in the cloud. And it was Jesus that spoke face to face to Moses. And Moses saw the figure of Jesus in the cloud. Then it's Jesus in Exodus 33, 20, telling Moses, I, Jesus, you can't see my face. So I'm repeating it like a broken record because I want it to sink in. You with me there? Now, do you want me to prove to you that when Moses went in the cloud, he saw the shape of Jehovah, the form of Jehovah? Not because Jehovah has a shape by nature. Don't misquote me. Don't attack straw man. But that Jehovah can assume a shape, a form of some kind, though he's shapeless and bodiless. Numbers 12, 5 to 8. Numbers 12, 5 to 8. Numbers 12, 5 to 8. France Toma, who told you he didn't see Jesus? He saw the Father and the Son, France. He saw the Godhead. Numbers 12, 5 to 8. Read with me. And Jehovah came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, hear now my words. Guys, pay attention. Jehovah speaking in the cloud. Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, Jehovah, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. 
My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. Guys, pay attention to verse 8. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, not dark speeches. I'll speak clearly to him, not parables. And the similitude, the form, the shape of Jehovah, he beholds. <whistles> Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Did you catch it? Jehovah comes down in a cloud, in a similitude, in a shape. For Moses to see so that Jehovah can speak mouth to mouth, face to face with Jehovah. So question, who is the Jehovah in the cloud that appears in a shape, a similitude that Moses sees with his eye, who speaks to Moses directly? If you tell me it's Jesus, then you got a problem. Because in Exodus thirty three twenty, it's Jesus who is saying, Moses, you can't see my face. But if you're telling me it's the father, you have a problem again. Because the father did show up in a shape. You see, either way you lose. Either way you lose. If it's the father, he just said, hey, Moses sees my shape, my similitude. So I'm appearing visibly. If it's the son, then you have the son saying, you can't see my face. Either way, you lose. Now, what's the point? Exodus 33.20 is not saying you cannot see the Father in some way, in some sense. That's not what it's saying. What Moses is asking is to see a more fuller expression of God's visible glory, more than what he already saw. In other words, my understanding is Moses wants to see God visibly in the same way that the inhabitants of heaven see God visibly on the throne. Right? Let me repeat, lest you attack straw man. I'm not saying God by nature has a shape, has a body, has a form. God by nature is shapeless, formless. What I'm saying is God can assume a form, can assume a shape for you to see. And that's what they see in heaven. In heaven, the angels see God the Father appear in a visible shape, so they can see his visible glory. So I understand Moses to be saying, show me that which the inhabitants of heaven see. God is saying, that you won't see, but I'll let you see a little more of me visibly. Did you understand now? Does it make sense or are you confused? If you're confused, let me know. What has took a lot of time. Whew. So does everyone see Exodus 33, 20 does not say you cannot see God the Father. It's simply saying. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. By nature, invisible, shapeless, formless. But they can appear in a shape and form of some kind that you can behold. Right? Moses got to see the Father and the Son. But he wanted to see the Father as well as the Son appear the way they do to the inhabitants of heaven. Like Isaiah saw in his vision in Isaiah 6. Clear? Before I move on? Yep, Ezekiel 1 as well. So, Exodus 3, 3.20 should never be used to prove something it wasn't meant to be used for. Exactly virtual warfare. The same is true of the Holy Spirit, virtual warfare. The Holy Spirit, who is God, is spirit, so he's shapeless, but he can assume a shape. Jesus, as God, is shapeless. As God, he's formless, but he can assume a shape. Right? So to answer the question, did Moses see the Father and the Son? He saw both. He saw both. Because you know who also was in the cloud? Jehovah and the angel. They were in the cloud. 
They were present together with Moses and Israel. Clear? Before I move on? Do you need me to now show you that Jehovah and the angel were there together? Or do you guys trust me? Or do I need to show you? Because up to you, I can show you that God and his angel are there. So it's good? All right. Oh, you want me to do it? All right. Exodus 13, 21 and 22. Man, you guys are so demanding. Exodus 13, 21, 22. Exodus 13, 21, 22. And Jehovah went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. So Jehovah's in the cloud, which looks like a pillar of fire at night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So Jehovah's in the cloud, right? Jehovah's in the cloud, right? And at daytime, the cloud looks like fire to lighten their way, right? Right? Okay. Exodus 14, 19 to 20. Exodus 14, 19 to 20. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Did you catch it? The angel is there. The cloud is there. When the angel goes ahead of him, the cloud follows the angel. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these so that the one came not near the other all night. Did you catch it? The cloud is there. The angel is there. When the angel goes forth, the cloud follows. See it? Exodus 14, 24. Yes, they are. Jesus is the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is Jesus. Exodus 14, 24. And it came to pass that in the morning, watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians to the pillar of fire and of the cloud. Did you catch it? Jehovah's in the cloud. He's looking. He's in the cloud looking. The angel is there. The cloud is there. Jehovah's in the cloud. And the angel, when it goes, the cloud follows. Right? Are you catching it or no? Okay. Exodus 23, 20 to 21. Exodus 23, 20 to 21. Behold, I send an angel before thee. This is Jehovah speaking to Moses and to the Israelites. Guys, pay attention. Jehovah speaking to Moses, to the Israelites. He goes, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he, that angel, won't forgive your sins. Pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Folks, what an amazing angel. Jehovah warns Moses and Israelites, this angel goes ahead of you. Don't get him angry. Don't provoke him. Obey his voice because he won't forgive your sins because my name is in him. Meaning this angel embodies my nature. My name meaning my nature, he embodies, he possesses, which is why he can do what I do, forgive your sins or condemn you. Guys, God is speaking about someone else, the angel. Since God is not that angel... Who is the God speaking to Moses and Israel, warning them about the angel? Who is the one speaking to Moses and the Israelites? Hey, that angel, I'm going to send him ahead of you. He embodies my name, and he can do what I can do. Forgive you or condemn you. Listen to him. Who is that God speaking to Moses and Israel about the angel? 
The Bible teaches the angel is Jesus Christ. So then the God who's speaking about the angel must be the father of Christ. So there you have proof. God the father is there speaking and Jesus the angel is there. They're both there. Right? Yep, Elizabeth. They're both there. Exodus 33, 1 to 3. Exodus 33, 1 to 3. Man, what a long session. And Jehovah said, pay attention here. Jehovah said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast, sent, hast brought up out of the land of Egypt unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Wait, wait, wait. God says, I myself won't be in the midst of you. Because of your sin, I may consume you. So my angel will go with you. Hold on. If the angel's going to go with them, but you're going to remain behind, because you don't want to be in their midst to consume them, that means God, you and the angel are different, right? Yeah. The angel's not me. I'm not the angel. But the same angel embodies your name, right? Yes. He possesses my nature. He is what I am in essence which is why he can forgive sins. So wait, God, if you're not the angel, and the angel's distinct from you and you sent him, and that angel is Jesus Christ, then who are you? The Father. You caught it? Now Jonathan wants to know, what about the Holy Spirit? Do you want me to show you, Jonathan, the Holy Spirit was there? But the reason why they didn't see the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit was indwelling them, empowering them, and preserving them, so that the entire Godhead was present, Father and Son leading them, and the Holy Spirit indwelling the elders to empower the elders and teaching the elders how to lead Israel. Do you want me to show you now? Numbers 11, 16 and 17. Numbers 11, 16 to 17. And Jehovah said unto Moses, Gather unto me 70 men of uh, the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. Now watch 17. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The Holy Spirit was on Moses, empowering Moses to guide the people. Yeah. And now that same Spirit on you will also be on the 70 and empowering the 70 to help you lead Israel. Hmm. God, his angel, and the Spirit. God, his angel, and the Spirit. Wow. Numbers 11, 24 to 29. Numbers 11, 24, 29. Al, are you with me? Are you on fire too, Al? Numbers 11, 24 to 29. Read with me. And Moses went out and told the people the words of Jehovah and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and sent them around about the tabernacle. Now, guys, you got to pay attention to this, right? Pay attention to this. It's going to be mind-blowing. Remember, there are 600,000 men in the wilderness, not counting women and children. You'll get lost in that crowd. So he tells the elders, come to the tabernacle here in the front, and the Spirit will fill you. Now notice, and Jehovah came down in a cloud and spake unto him, took of the Spirit that was upon him, and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. So they bro broke out in ecstatic speech as a visible sign to the crowd these men are spirit-filled. They started prophesying, ecstatic speech. That's the implication of the word. In such a way that it got the attention of people. Wow, 
Man, those elders are filled with the Spirit like Moses. Look, look. A visible manifestation that these men were filled with the Spirit. Are you catching it? Okay. But now here is where it's going to get amazing. 26. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp of the people. And Joshua, the son of Nun. Now watch what Joshua, the son of Nun says. Joshua, son of Nun, the son of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord, Moses, forbid them. Stop them. Pay attention, 29. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Are you jealous for my sake? I would that God would make all of Jehovah's people prophets and that Jehovah would put his spirit upon them. Do you see the humbleness of Moses? Why are you being jealous for my sake? I wish that every single Israelite was filled with the Holy Spirit to be a prophet, then they wouldn't need me. But wait, let me, let me ask you a question. Guys, let's bring out the implication of this. 600,000 men in the camp in the wilderness, not counting women and children. Two of them, Eldad, Medad, are in the camp. They didn't go to the tent. The 70 elders were at the tent. They got filled with spirit, started prophesying. But somewhere in that crowd, in that huge crowd, right, like a stadium filled with people that no one could see, somewhere there, out there in that crowd, two started prophesying and only two. And then someone noticed and ran to Joshua. Hey, there's two over there. They're prophesying. Get Moses' attention. What kind of attributes must the Spirit have to find two of the elders in the midst of this crowd that no one could see and fill them also as a sign that they too are leaders and then fill the 70 who are away from them at the front, at the tent at the same time, filling all of them Simultaneously. What kind of attributes? Malika, these are no distraction. Just go back, listen from the beginning. The Holy Spirit knew exactly where Eldad Medad was in this huge crowd that, humanly speaking, you would not know. And then filled them while he's filling this group here. So there are two groups far away from each other in the wilderness that you can't find them, man. Right? But the Spirit found them and filled them at the same time he filled this group. At the same time. That means the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, omniscient. He knew who the elders were. He knew where they were. And could fill them wherever they were at the same time and empower them to lead. Not right now, Shenabi. Don't ask me to change subjects, please. Okay. Now, did you see what you just learned from the Exodus? God the Father, Jesus Christ, the messenger of God and Holy Spirit, came down in time and space, to assist Moses and Israel during the Exodus. The Godhead came down to the earth. Still don't believe me? Exodus 31, verse 3, but we're going to read 1 to 6. Exodus 31, verse 3, but we're going to read 1 to 6. Exodus 31, verse 3, but 1 to 6. Read here. By the way, Numbers 11 is a foretaste of Pentecost, right? What was the sign that these elders were spirit-filled? They started prophesying in a way that got people's attention. Just like when the apostles were filled with spirit, they spoke in tongues in a miraculous way that got people's attention. So Numbers 11, you're getting a foretaste of Pentecost during the Exodus. Exodus 31, verses 1 to 6. Let's read. 31. Verses 1 to 6. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, 
See, I have called by name Bazaliel, the son of Uri, the son of Hor of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God. Sure sounds like the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 11. Note what the Spirit filled Bazaliel with. Filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom. Wisdom from the Spirit. In understanding. Understanding from the Spirit. In knowledge. Knowledge from the Spirit of God. In all manner of workmanship. <clears throat> to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work in all the manner of workmanship. And behold, I have given with him Aholiab, the, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan in the hearts of all that are wise hearted. I have put wisdom that they may make all that I've commanded thee. Did you catch it? The Holy Spirit took a group of Israelites Filled them with wisdom, understanding, and the ability to do craftsmanship, to do construction. Even your success, success as a construction work, worker is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And yet you see the same gifts of the Holy Spirit here that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 12. Who's David was? Exodus 35, 30 to 31. I have no idea what you're talking about. Get rid of them. Exodus 35, 30 to 31. Yeah, get rid of this was. Yeah. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, Jehovah hath called by name Basileel, Basileel, the son of Uri, the son of Hor, of the tribe of Judah, and hath filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, in all manner of workmanship. Did you catch it? The Holy Spirit gave him wisdom, understanding, and the ability to work in construction. Well, if you read 1 Corinthians 12, you're going to see, you're going to see that the Holy Spirit gives wisdom and understanding of some of the gifts. But notice, in the Old Testament, these prophets, these saints already knew that the Holy Spirit gave these gifts to the people of God. So, Jonathan, everyone else, according to the Pentateuch, according to Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, who came down from heaven to guide Moses and Israel out of Egypt, preserve them in the wilderness, and bring them into the land, who guided them? Who preserved them? Who watched over them? The Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? Now go to Exodus 33, 14, and 15. Exodus 33, 14 and 15. I'm going to end it with John 1, 18. And he said, Jehovah speaking, he said, my presence shall go with thee. Pay attention, folks. God says, my presence, my face, my face will go with thee and I will give thee rest. I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, if thy presence, if you, Jehovah, your face, go not with me, carry us not up hence. Did you catch it? Jehovah says in Exodus 33, 14, my face will go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. So, folks, according to Exodus 33, 14, pay attention. Exodus 33, 14, pay attention. Who is going to give the Israelites rest? Jehovah speaking. Jehovah says, my face will go before you. And I will give you rest. Who is going to give them rest here in Exodus 33, 33, 14? Jehovah speaking. My presence shall go with thee. I will give thee rest. Be specific. In this verse, who's speaking? Who's giving rest? In this verse. Give me the name. Okay, yeah, you're right. It's the Father, but give me the name in the text itself. Jehovah. Thank you. No, see, you said Holy Spirit. No. Jehovah. I know it's the Father, but be specific. The text doesn't say Father. It says Jehovah, right? Jehovah. Now, 
Let's look at 14 one more time. Let's see if you can connect the dots. Notice what 14 says. Pay attention to 14. One more time. Okay. Watch here. I need your undivided attention. My presence shall go with thee. Notice Jehovah speaking as if his presence is someone else, right? He could have just said, I'm going with you. But no, he makes it complicated. My face will go with you. Implying as if his face is someone else. My face will go ahead of you because that's what the word presence is in Hebrew. My face. And then 15, Moses says, if your face doesn't go before me, don't take us up, right? So J Moses, I'm sending my face. He'll gather you and bring you into the land. Moses says in 15, if your face doesn't go with me, don't send us, right? But who is Jehovah's face? Exodus 33, verse 2. Exodus 33, verse 2. Exodus 33, verse 2. And I will send an angel before thee. Bam! My face is the angel. The angel is my face. Bam! You caught it or no? Did you catch it? Moses, I will send my face before thee. Verse 2, I send the angel before thee. Conclusion, the angel who goes before you is my face. My face is the angel. The angel is my face. Still don't believe me? X, Isaiah 63, verse 9. Still don't believe me, right, you skeptics? Isaiah 63, verse 9. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. Bam! Bam! The angel of his face saved Israel. My angel goes ahead of you. My face goes ahead of you to save you and to destroy your enemies. Isaiah 63, verse 9, the angel of his face, the angel who beholds his face, the angel who is his face. <whistles> <laughs> Mother Nelly. You caught it? So Exodus 33, 2, 14 and 15. I sent an angel before thee to drive out these nations. My face will go before thee. And Moses says, if your face doesn't go, don't send us. The angel who goes before you. My face who goes before you, one and the same. My angel is my face. My face is the angel. He goes before you to save you and fight and destroy the enemies before you. Is it clear or no? You getting it or no before I move on? Man, was this long. Let's look at Exodus 33, 14 one more time. One more time. I think we'll end it with this, and I'll do a part two on whether God the Father can be seen. Exodus 33, 14, one more time. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. My face goes before you. I will give you rest. Okay, guys, Jehovah says, I will give you rest. This is to Moses, right? Please pay attention. Now let's read Isaiah 63, 10 and 11 and 14. Isaiah 63, verses 10, 11, and 14. We're going to skip 13. Jehovah here says, my face goes before you. I will give you rest, Moses. Isaiah 63, 10, and 11, and 14. Watch. But he remembered, but they rebelled. Pay attention, guys. Pay attention. Isaiah is recounting Moses and the Exodus. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit, God and his Holy Spirit. They grieved his Holy Spirit, angered his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. Now, guys, pay attention to 11, Jonathan, everyone else. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? Bam! Isaiah confirms the Holy Spirit was in Moses. 
Did you catch it? But then wait, 14. 14. As a beast goeth down into the valley, the spirit of Jehovah caused him to rust. Wait. The spirit of Jehovah caused them to rust? But Exodus 33, 14 says, Jehovah caused him and Israel to rust. Jehovah gave them rest in Exodus 33, 14. The Spirit of Jehovah gave them rest in Isaiah 63, 14. The Holy Spirit was in Moses, according to Isaiah 63, 11. And Jehovah was there speaking to Moses. And the angel of Jehovah's face was the angel that went ahead of them, who's the face of God that brought them into the land. Folks, you know what you just proved? You know what you just proved? The Jehovah that was speaking in Exodus 33 was God the Father. God the Father mentioned the angel who is his face, Jesus Christ. And then we have reference to the Holy Spirit being present in Moses and the elders to lead the nation. We're done. Lord Jesus willing, sometime this week I have to do part two. But you need to go back. You need to go back. Listen to this carefully, thoroughly. Listen to my interaction with James Knapp because he provided an opportunity of how to refute arguments that seek to deny that God the Father has been seen and can be seen. You saw that is not biblical. God the Father can be seen, has been seen. And you also saw my explanation that God, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, by their very nature as God, are bodiless, shapeless, formless, timeless. But because they're almighty, Father, Son, Holy Spirit can assume any shape, form, and appear in multiple shapes and forms and be bound to none of them. Right? Lord Jesus willing, I have to do a part two on John 1.18, John 6.46, and 1 John 4.12, as well as John 5.37. The fact is, nowhere, nowhere in the Bible does it say God the Father cannot be seen or hasn't been seen. That is not scriptural. I don't know if I can do it tomorrow, so I need your prayers. Lord willing, I'm flying out to Colorado tomorrow. I'm going to meet with some brothers. I'm going to a conference, and I'm going to teach at the end of the week. Lord willing, I'll try to make some time to do a live stream while I'm there. So pray for my traveling safeties. Pray for a powerful anointing. Please, please fast and pray for my daughters and I, that God will keep us healthy and safe, that God will provide financially, graciously through me to take care of my daughters. Please pray that God will help me to become holier, more in love with Jesus, more obedient, more pure, die to my flesh, and please ask God for confirmation. I'm still waiting for the green light on the other side. I got the green light here because in two weeks, I have to drive out in my car for two days to head to a new state, starting a new chapter in my life. Please pray God opens the door and saves me from my tribulations and this corrupt judicial system. Lord willing, I'll see you this week if I can. Go back, listen to this slowly, carefully. And by the way, go back and watch all my older videos. I've done sessions on my YouTube page for the past two years. So I got a lot of video discussions you haven't seen yet on the Trinity in the Old Testament, on Jesus as the God-man, on the Holy Spirit, on the Bible, on salvation, refuting Joe's witnesses, refuting Unitarians and Muslims. Watch them. Hit the like button, pass them on, memorize information, download the videos to your YouTube channel, make clips of these discussions, and pray that I'm used more mightily for the glory of Christ until I die or until he returns because I want to live for Jesus. To live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God in the flesh. And he will come sooner than later. Come, Lord Jesus, we love you. Cover us by your blood. Cover my daughters by your blood. Fight for them, Lord. Seal us by your spirit. Save us from the evil one. And help us to live for you, love you, and die for you.
because you're worthy. Son of God, Son of David, Son of Mary, our Lord, our God, our love, our life, our Savior, our everything. We love you. We are in love with you, Lord Jesus, because you're in love with us. Thank you, Lord. We love you. God bless you guys. Stay in contact. Hopefully, I'll see you this week. Lord bless.